If you have your Bibles, open them. First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three, and uh, well, this will be a passage for us this morning. But before we go any further, let's just pause for a moment and ask God's blessing on our thoughts today. Lord, we do give you thanks for all that you have done for us. We thank you for your faithfulness in every circumstance. We thank you for the promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. That where two or three are gathered together, that there you are in the midst of them. Lord, we thank you that we can look into your word today. We pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to us. We've come to worship you and to praise you, but also, Lord, that you, we might hear from you. So we ask that our hearts be open and fill us with yourself and may we respond willing and humble hearts, ready to do what it is you ask from each one of us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it was warm this morning, so we opened everything up to let the air flow through, but I can feel a breeze behind me. Is anybody getting chilled? Are you okay? If, if it's nice, I'll leave it as is, otherwise we can at least shut the door and limit the breeze. Um, if it starts to rain, we've discovered the windows have sensors, they will sh shut by themselves. So, um, uh, hopefully it will be okay. But if you, anyone gets cold or gets a draft, um, we can shut that door, at least that will limit some of the, uh, the, the, the wind coming through. Okay, alright. We live in challenging times, I think we can all say that. There's so many voices in the world today clamoring for our attention. It can be sometimes difficult to tell what is right and what is wrong, how to live our lives, how not to live our lives. People are confused about these things. Difficult to discern the false <coughs> Keeping your wits about you, not to be led astray down a rabbit trail or down a dead end. Many times what seems to hold out promise ends up being a little more than a mirage. You know what mirage is? You all know the stories of people get trapped out in the desert. In the distance, they think they see water, and they make their way through the desert for the water. When they get there, they discover it's nothing but sand, and the mirage just keeps, keeps moving on beyond. Uh, the farther they go, they never quite seem to catch up. It's an optical illusion. Come by the air as it heats up. Actually, what you're seeing is apparently the reflection of the sky, and uh, it looks like water. So people uh, uh, can. Uh, Maybe in Scotland, on a rare occasions, on a very hot day, you're looking down the road, a tar tarmac road, you know, it's all heated up by the sun, and it can look like there's puddles of water in the distance, and if it's not, it's just a mirage. But how many desperate people over the years, maybe thirst quenched individuals, marooned in the desert, like conditions, have been led a course, or led off stray, if you will, by a mirage, thinking that uh, they will, uh, their thirst will be satisfied only to be disappointed. Ever chasing the mirage, but it always just remains beyond their reach. And I think many people today are in similar danger of being led off course by a mirage-like vision of what is right and best for our future. These modern-day prophets of a brave new world are following the wisdom of their own devising. They think they know better than God what is best for us. Promoting a vision for society that is false and cannot deliver. I've come across a term recently that's becoming more and more used. It's called virtue signaling. You come across that term yourself, virtue signaling? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's describing a, a new phenomenon where people are uh, trying to express their opinions or their sentiments to try and demonstrate what a good person they are their good character, that they've got a good social conscience, uh, or, or the moral correctness of their position. But they do it by expressing outrage. We see it on social media a lot, where people express their moral outrage, but really it's little more than just harassment or abuse by some of the most intolerant and bigoted of people. One trend I find worrying today is how often Christians become the object of this moral outrage. Fact, if statistics are true, Christians today are the most persecuted group in the world. We don't feel it as much here in the West, but in many countries around the world, Christians suffer discrimination in the workplace, in the schools, before the law. They can have their property stolen or destroyed, can be attacked in the streets. 
and the governments appear to be unable to do anything about it, or they just turn a blind eye to such things. I'm not telling you this this morning to stir up any fear or anger or ill will on your part, but I do find it difficult to understand how the modern world, after all the lessons of history that we have, that uh, down to discrimination and injustice can still be allowed or receive official sanction. Have we learned nothing from our history? And yet more and more we see Christians, even in the modern West, being discriminated against in one way or another. It's been like this before. The early days of the New Testament church, Christians suffered persecution in varying degrees. First Peter, our text before us this morning, was written to Christians suffering under persecution. The New Testament church was established in a largely pagan environment. There was opposition and hostility to what Christians believed and to their way of life. Suspicion. There were rumours spread about, false rumours about what Christians did behind their closed doors. Roman law had not yet officially banned Christianity, but that was coming. So what advice does Peter, the apostle, the disciple who was in the company of Jesus, what advice does Peter give to Christians living in difficult times? How should we respond to injustice or outright persecution? Should we fight back? Should we take up arms to defend our rights? Or should we roll over and let our enemies have free reign to walk all over us? How is it possible to maintain an effective witness in such conditions? Well, let's look more closely at our text this morning. I think there's four keys here to having an effective Christian witness, no matter what the circumstances. The first verse tells us in verse 8, finally, he says, as Peter draws his, his uh, discussion to a, a, a conclusion, he says, Be of one mind, be all of one mind, having compassion one on another. Love. As brothers, be pitiful or be full of pity and courteous. This whole paragraph is an outworking of this command in verse 8 to love as brothers, to have compassion one for another. Why the emphasis on how we treat one another? But I've noticed in life that when things go wrong, very often times the first people that bear the brunt are often those who are closest to us. Our family, perhaps even those within our own church fellowship. Why do we do that? Because there are people who are most, these are the people who are most likely to offer us support and help if we find ourselves in difficult times. But that's the irrationality or selfishness, isn't it? That we often latch out at those closest to us. So Peter here emphasizes, above all, he said, you find yourselves being pressed between a rock and a hard place, but stretch to the limit. Maintain that loving attitude towards others, especially towards those who are closest to you. Have one mind. Be like-minded. Live in harmony. Compassion. Having or showing sympathy for others. Romans chapter 12 verse 15 puts it like this, weeping with those that weep and rejoicing with those that rejoice, sharing in one another's uh, 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 lives in a, in a positive and helpful way, being sensitive to the needs of others, not trampling over their feelings, but being considerate and caring of one another. You know, if you want to find a fault with someone, it's not difficult, because none of us are perfect. We've all got faults. It doesn't take a genius to find fault in somebody. The difficult thing is getting along with each other despite these faults. My enemy, the Bible would say if it says anything, you take it, it's focus on the good in one another. That's where the secret comes in being of one mind and striving towards harmony and compassion. Love as brothers, family love. The Greek word here is Philadelphos. There's a city in America named after this very word, Philadelphia. Most people today living in Philadelphia have no idea that the name of the city comes from the Bible. But it means city of brotherly love. It got its name because it was founded by Christian believers. The city today would do well to remember its Christian origins. The give and take, it's in a family. That's what it's talking about here. We put up with each other. Why? Because we live under the same roof. If we don't put up with each other, then it won't be long before things begin to unravel. 
The need to put aside personal differences in the family for the sake of getting on with each other. This is what he is talking about here. Be of one mind. Have compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Love as a family. And then he says be pitiful. That's not being pitiful in the sense of being pitiable, but being full of pity. Being tender-hearted. Being compassionate. Again, this is the practical outworking of Christian love. To act sincerely in truth from the heart. Not doing something, not treating the others just because you have to be seen to be doing the right thing, but doing it because really you mean it from your heart. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. He says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue only, but in deed and in truth. In other words, don't just talk about it. Get up and do something about it. Do it from the heart because you genuinely care. Following this rule of love in your relations with one another. And then he said, he says at the end of the verse, being courteous. You know, there's one thing we need more of in our society today, it's courtesy. Whatever happened to common courtesy? The word here in the Bible actually is the word lowliness of mind or humility. Showing humility in your relations with other people. You know, you really can't separate courtesy and humility. The two are kind of linked. We treat others with courtesy because we, in truth, see ourselves as no better than them. We're all in this together. First Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 says, It's not to think of ourselves above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up one against another. Pride is often at the source of our conflicts, or hurt pride, when our feelings get offended. That's where conflict in human relations often begins. And so the Bible here is encouraging us to treat everyone with courtesy, from your heart, from a humble heart. This goes a long way to helping uh, avoid conflict or helping to bring resolution to conflict. And he said to do it one of another. Have compassion one of another. Some try to limit this verse as being described only in relationships with other Christians within the church fellowship. But I think that probably does injustice to this passage. If you look down at verse 15, as Peter continues on, he says, We sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you. So I think Peter here has in mind not just relationships with other Christians, but actually relationships with everyone, with people in general, whomever God might put across your path. So he establishes the rule of love in verse 8, and then he goes on in the following verses to kind of tell us a bit more what he means by this. Verse 9, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile or deceit. Let it forsake evil and do good. Let it seek peace and follow it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Vengeance of any kind has no place in the life of a Christian. Romans chapter 12 encourages us to live at peace with all men as much as possible. Uh, uh, and uh, as much as God enables you to be able to do this, he says, Vengeance belongs to me. Do not avenge yourselves, for vengeance belongs to the Lord. He says, You leave that to me, I will take care of these things. Your job is not to be overcome of evil, but to overcome evil with good. But you've no idea what they said to me. You've no idea what they did to me behind my back. Doesn't the Bible say, An eye for an eye? You know, people can be quick to quote the Bible when they think it says what they want it to say. But the principle of an eye for an eye does not give you free reign to take matters into your own hands to give back as good as you got. In fact, that principle, an eye for an eye, in Deuteronomy, is, qu is quoted in the books of the law. It's actually a legal principle laid down. The principle that the sentence must fit the crime. The crime should not be 
uh, that the sentence should not be greater than the crime or less than the crime. An eye for an eye it should be fair and just. It's an instruction for judges on how to administer the law. It has nothing to do whatsoever with how we as individuals ought to treat each other. The rule of love that Peter is laying down here is the rule that God would have guide our relationships with one another. If the Bible teaches us anything, it teaches us that it's a sin to seek revenge. It's a sin for a Christian to hold a grudge, to withhold forgiveness when it is due. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 reminds us that uh, we ought to follow peace with all men, with everyone, and holiness without which no man should see God. There's nothing holy about seeking revenge. If we would know how God wants us to act, then we should look, we can look no higher than to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who when his enemies took him and were nailing his hands at his feet to the cross, prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Peter refers to this in the previous chapter. If you still have your Bibles open before you, just look back to chapter 2 and verse 21. It says, For even he ran to where he called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile or deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled or threatened or mistreated, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judges righteously. He was content to leave everything in his heavenly Father's hands. Is there someone in your life against whom you may harbor bitter feelings? You've not tried to make things right. Then realize it is sin. God can't bless you as long as you hold on to this in your life. So what should you do? Go repent. Confess your wrong attitude to God, and then, if at all possible, seek to make things right with the individual. I'll be the first one to say, it's a lot easier said than done. But if you want release, if you want to be set free, if you want the joy of your salvation to return, then this is the way. So, the first principle that Peter lays down for us as Christians you find yourself, no matter what circumstances you're in, if you find yourself under a persecution or a tag or pushed up against the wall, the first thing you must do is follow the rule of love in all that you do towards others. And then the next rule, <coughs> find it in verses 13 and 14. Who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, for doing good, well, happy are you. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Be followers of that which is good. Not just imitators, but to pursue after it. The word here is a word that carries with it the zeal of being zealous for something. This is not half-hearted. Be followers of that which is good. Follow it with all the energy and enthusiasm that you can muster for a cause. Now in Jesus' day, there was a group, a political group, known as the Zealots. <clears throat> they were Jewish um, patriots. They would see themselves as freedom fighters. The Romans would see them as terrorists. <coughs> These Zealots uh, got up to all sorts of activities, sabotage and even assassination to try and get rid of the, the uh, Roman <coughs> authority. Simon, one of Jesus' disciples, was formerly a zealot. It's called Simon the Zealot. Obviously, when he became a part of Christ's uh, uh, company, inner company of disciples, it meant leaving behind those former activities. Many people today are zealous about a great many things. About protecting the environment. It's a good thing we should protect the environment, but what you eat, we should watch what you eat. But some people can be quite zealous about these things. Some people are zealous about making money. Some people today in society are zealous about something they call social justice. But the more I learn about what they mean by it, it has nothing to do with justice and very little benefit for all of society. It is more a failed grab for power. Of all the things that you can be zealous for, 
that Christians should be zealous for that which is good. That's what should fire our imaginations. That's what should uh, uh, encourage us in all that we do, motivate us in what we do and what we say. God is good. He is good in Himself. He is good in His character. He is good in all His ways. Everything that God does is good. And it brings honour and glory to Him. So when Peter says, be zealous for that which is good, follow after that which is good, it's much as the same thing as saying, be zealous for the things of God. Pursue after all that is good with passion, with great desire. Put your heart into it. How often do what we do for God is kind of at the end of the day, if it has some time left over, or uh, oh, I'm just a bit too weary. So, but being passionate for the things of God. Don't settle for anything of lesser quality. God is passionate. He's passionate for good because He's good in Himself. So let the goodness of God motivate you in all that you do and say. God honors those who are likewise passionate for what is good. It might mean, as it says in verse 14, that sometimes people don't understand. And you might sometimes be persecuted for a, a, a position that you may take or for uh, the way you live your life. But God says, don't worry about that. Leave it with me. I will take care of these things. You just keep on doing what is right and good. Verse 15. There's another rule that it puts out. Verse 15 says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Set apart the Lord God in your hearts. It's as much as what we might say is put the Lord first in your life. It might, it might be the way we put it today. And notice it's a command stated in the imperative. It implies an action on our part. Something that we choose to do. It's not something that happens just by osmosis or uh, because we woke up one day and we just happened to wake up and with our feet on the right side of the bed. No, it's something that we must actively participate in doing. Sometimes people talk about the secret to living a victorious Christian life. As though God had somehow hidden away the key to living the Christian life. Only to those who are clever enough to discover it for themselves. No, there's no secret at all to living a true, spiritually victorious Christian life. It begins right here by putting the Lord first in your heart. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. When the Lord rules on the throne of your life, He gives you the ability to bear up under trying circumstances. The strength to persevere when facing opposition. The courage to stand true in the face of criticism. What is it that often keeps Christians from speaking out for Christ? Isn't it fear? We're afraid maybe of what people might think. Fear of failure, fear of rejection or opposition. As Alexander McLaren was a, a Baptist minister in, I think it was Manchester for many years, a very large church, um, years and years ago. He, he said this, only he who can say the Lord is the strength of my life can go on to say, of whom shall I be afraid? We sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and that is the source of the strength to persevere and to rise above, indeed, to soar above your problems. Ask yourself, what is it that motivates me in my life? Is it what my friends think of me? What my schoolmates might think? My neighbours or my family members? Am I worried what other people think of me? Is it what brings me pleasure? What makes me happy? Is it what satisfies me and gratifies my senses? That's what motivates me in life. Or is it the Lord? And what he thinks of it, what would please him the most? When the Lord is the most important object of your heart, you will not fear what others think. You will know what to say and you will know how to act when the time comes. And so Peter says here, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. So far Peter has encouraged believers to let the rule of love govern in all the relationships with one another. To be zealous for what is good and right and best. To put the Lord first in your life, first in your affections and all that motivates you in life. Then lastly, verse 15 and 16, 
he encouraged us to maintain a firm but respectful witness. Verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. He goes on to say, and be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear, with humility and with respect. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you and of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Sometimes, like you said, you get under fire, you want to react. Give back just as they gave to you. But Peter is here saying, no, you just keep on doing right. And the truth will rise to the surface. Be ready. Be ready always. You know, if you're a soldier in the army, and you wait until the day of battle to learn how to use your gun, too late. That's why you send them off to drill camp to learn all the skills that they need and to exercise and get fit and strong so that when the day of battle comes, they're ready, they're prepared, they know what to do. Same with firemen. Think about all the We've got a, a couple of men in the church over there that did um, uh, 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 volunteer uh, uh, fire uh, uh, men for, for many years. And all the different preparations, you know, taking weekends away here and there, throughout, just to go over some of the skills and to practice some of the things that need to be done. So that when the day came, and they found themselves in an emergency in the middle of fire, they know what to do. They wouldn't be caught off guard. They'd be safe. If you wait till there's a real emergency to practice your skills, then it's too late. And what Peter is saying here is, Christian, if you wait till you're put on the spot by someone, Maybe asking you a question of why you're a Christian or why you believe what you do. If you wait till then to figure out what you believe, then it's probably too late. You're going to stumble. You're going to choke. Be ready to give a reason. Be prepared. How do you do this? Well, spend time in prayer. Spend time in the presence of God. Spend time in the reading and the study of the Bible. It's what church is for. It's designed to help you with uh, with with your understanding of the word of God, where we can encourage and challenge each other in the things of God. Second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen tells us to be diligent to study the word of God, that we might rightly divide the word of truth, that we might understand God's word. Be ready always. And how are we to witness for Christ? How do we go about sharing our faith? He tells us at the end of verse 15 that we always do it with an attitude of meekness and fear, an attitude of gentleness and humility, an attitude of respect. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6 tells us that your speech should always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Yes, you tell the truth, but make sure it's always spoken with grace. As in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, the apostle Paul says, that it was his uh, desire always to speak the truth in love. These two things have to go together. If you cannot speak the truth in love, then my recommendation to you is to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and if all you do is love and you don't tell the truth, you're not helping the person in any way of any practical benefit. Love is great, but you need to encourage them in the ways of truth. These things go together. So what does he mean here? Be ready to give an answer to everyone that asks you a reason of hope that is in you with weakness and with fear. Never attempt to force or manipulate someone to make a decision for Christ. Sometimes with zeal, we can be guilty of doing this. Oh, we just know if they could just get their heart right with the Lord, that would be the best thing in the world for them. But we can't force them to make a decision. Otherwise, if they've made a decision under duress, or they've made the decision to please you, or they've made the decision to get you off their back, it's not a real decision. It has no saving power. The only decision that will stick <coughs> is the decision that the individual makes for himself or herself. So, Peter encourages us to witness, to be firm, to give out a, 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 a reason for the hope that lies within us, but to do it with meekness and with respect. Uh, respect. Never get into a heated discussion over the things of Christ and His Word. That happens sometimes, especially some of you think particularly belligerent and they, they insult you and ridicule you for your faith, 
you find your, your, the handles on the back of your neck getting, you feel your temperature beginning to boil, and you want to just, no, don't do that. Answer them with humility and with respect. God is not honored when you get in a shouting match with someone over the precious things of Christ. If you have to raise your voice to make your point, then you've already lost the argument. Never burn bridges behind you. We do that sometimes. We've had maybe a particularly bad experience and we just want to have done with and never see again. We burn bridges behind us. Well, I told them that will teach them never to mess with me again. Well, you might have won the argument on the day, but you kind of lost your testimony in the process. Sometimes I've seen Christians behave so poorly that they leave behind themselves hurt feelings or a bad impression such that people will never listen to them again. When others think of you, do they wince when they remember an awful experience they had with you when you lost your temper or you said things that should never have been said? In such cases, it were best that you didn't say anything at all about Jesus because you only bring shame and dishonor to his name. So Peter says here, be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear, with respect, with humility, with grace. You say, well, what if I've already ruined my testimony with someone? What if I've already messed up? Well, say, I'm sorry. I mean it. It's as simple as that. It's amazing how far a sincere apology can go to repairing a damaged relationship. Pray. Ask for God's help. And then have the courage to make things right. Nine times out of ten, it begins the healing process. And often leads to great blessing. <coughs> Before we close, I think it's important to know what Peter does not say. He does not encourage believers to be silent and to hide their faith in secret in times of persecution. Nor does he encourage Christians to be foolish or to act with brazen disregard for the consequences. Instead, he encourages believers to be governed by the rule of love in all the relationships with others. To be zealous for what is good, what is right, which honors God. To put the Lord first in your life. He is the motivating factor in your life and all that you do and say. And yes, maintain a firm and truthful testimony, but do so with respect and with humility. We may not suffer the intense persecution that believers sometimes suffer in other countries. But sometimes we're far less effective in our Christian testimony than they. What are you doing to get the truth out to those who need to hear They're all around us in our community? Can you name someone you spoke to in the past week or the past month about Jesus? Who are you praying for right now that they might come to Jesus? Peter says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you with humility and with respect. Well, just a few thoughts of challenge for God's people today from God's Word. I pray that there's something there that can be a help to you. If you have a concern or a cause for anything that I've raised this morning, please feel free to stay behind. I'd be happy to share further with you. And thank the Lord that we serve God who is faithful and who is gracious and is merciful with us. If we could be as patient with others, half as patient with others as God is with us, this world would be a better place. Alright, let's go to God in prayer and ask His blessing on us. Oh, no, let's sing a hymn together first. I, I purify my heart. This is a wonderful hymn of consecration.